Chapter 7 75,000 tons, dead weight, rushing through the fog at the rate of 50 feet a second, had hurled itself at an iceberg. Had the impact been received by a perpendicular wall, the elastic resistance of bending plates and frames would have overcome the momentum with no more damage to the passengers than a severe shaking up, and to the ship than the crushing in her bows and the killing, to a man, of the watch below. She would have backed off and slightly down by the head, finished the voyage at reduced speed to rebuild on insurance money and benefit largely in the end by the consequent advertising of her indestructibility. But a low beach, possibly formed by the recent overturning of the berg, received a titan, and with her keel cutting the ice like the steel runner of an ice boat and her great weight resting on the starboard bilge, she rose out of the sea, higher and higher, until the propellers in the stern were half exposed. Then meeting an easy spiral rise in the ice under her port bow, she heeled, overbalanced, and crashed down on her side to starboard. The holding down bolts of 12 boilers and three triple expansion engines, unintended to hold such weights from a perpendicular flooring, snapped and down through a maze of ladders, gratings, and fore and aft bulkheads came these giant masses of steel and iron, puncturing the sides of the ship, even where backed by solid, resisting ice, and filling the engine and boiler rooms with scalding steam which brought a quick, though tortured death, to each of the hundred men on duty in the engineer's department. Amid the roar of escaping steam and the bee-like buzzing of nearly 3,000 human voices raised in agonized screams and callings from within the enclosing walls and the whistling of air through hundreds of open dead lights as the water entering the holes of the crushed and riven starboard side expelled it, the Titan moved slowly backward and launched herself into the sea, where the floated low on her side a dying monster, groaning with her death wound. A solid pyramid-like hummock of ice left to starboard as the steamer ascended and which projected close alongside the upper or boat deck as she fell over, at caught in succession, every pair of davits to starboard, bending and wrenching them, smashing boats and snapping tackles and gripes, until, as the ship cleared itself, it capped the pile of wreckage, strewing the ice in front of and around it with the end and broken stanchions of the bridge. And in this shattered, box-like structure, dazed by the sweeping fall through an arc of 70-foot radius, crouched Roland, bleeding from a cut in his head and still holding to his breast the little girl, now too frightened to cry. By an effort of will, he aroused himself and looked. To his eyesight, twisted and fixed to a shorter focus by the drug he had taken, the steamship was little more than a bluff on the moon-whitened fog. Yet he thought he could see men clambering and working on the upper davits, and the nearest boat, number 24, seemed to be swinging by the tackles. Then the fog shut her out, though her position was still indicated by the roaring of steams from her iron lungs. This ceased in time, leaving behind it the horrid humming sound and whistling of air. And when these two were suddenly hushed, and the ensuing silence broken by dull, booming reports, as from bursting compartments, Roland knew that the Holocaust was complete, that the invincible Titan, with nearly all of her people, unable to climb vertical floors and ceilings, was beneath the surface of the sea. Mechanically, his benumbed faculties had received and recorded the impressions of the last few moments, he could not comprehend to the full the horror of it all. Yet his mind was keenly alive to the peril of the woman whose appealing voice he had heard and recognized, 
the woman of his dream and the mother of the child in his arms. He hastily examined the wreckage. Not a boat was intact. Creeping down to the water's edge, he hailed, with all the power of his weak voice, two possible but invisible boats beyond the fog, calling on them to come and save the child, to look out for a woman who had been on deck under the bridge. He shouted this woman's name, the one that he knew, encouraging her to swim, to tread water, to float on wreckage, and to answer him, until he came to her. There was no response, and when his voice had grown hoarse and futile, and his feet numb from the cold of the thawing ice, he returned to the wreckage, weighed down and all but crushed by the blackest desolation that had, so far, come into his unhappy life. The little girl was crying, and he tried to soothe her. I want mama, she wailed. Hush, baby, hush, he answered, wearily and bitterly. So do I. More than heaven, but I think our chances are about even now. Are you cold, little one? We'll go inside, and I'll make a house for us. He removed his coat, tenderly wrapped the little figure in it, and with the injunction, don't be afraid now, placed her in the corner of the bridge, which rested on its forward side. As he did so, the bottle of whiskey fell out of the pocket. It seemed an age since he had found it there and it required a strong effort of reasoning before he remembered its full significance. Then he raised it to hurl it down the incline of ice, but stopped himself. I'll keep it, he muttered. It may be safe in small quantities, and we'll need it on this ice. He placed it in the corner. Then, removing the canvas cover from one of the wrecked boats, he hung it over the open side and end of the bridge, crawled within, and donned his coat a ready-made slop chest garment designed for a larger man, and buttoning in around himself and the little girl, lay down on the hard woodwork. She was still crying, but soon, under the influence of the warmth of his body, ceased and went to sleep. Huddled in a corner, he gave himself up to the torments of his thoughts. Two pictures alternately crowded his mind, one, that of the woman of his dream, entreating him to come back which his memory clung to as an oracle. The other of this woman, cold and lifeless, fathoms deep in the sea. He pondered on her chances. She was close to or on the bridge steps. And boat number 24, which he was almost sure was being cleared away as he looked, would swing close to her as it descended. She could climb in and be saved unless the swimmers from doors and hatches should swamp the boat. And in his agony of mind, he cursed these swimmers, preferring to see her, mentally, the only passenger in the boat, with the watch on deck to pull her to safety. The potent drug he had taken was still at work, and this, with the musical wash of the sea on the icy beach, and the muffled creaking and crackling beneath and around him, the voice of the iceberg, overcame him finally, and he slept, to waken at daylight with limbs stiffened and numb, almost frozen. And all night, as he slept, a boat with the number 24 on her bow, pulled by sturdy sailors and steered by brass button officers, was making for the southern lane, the highway of spring traffic. And crouching the stern sheets of his boat was a moaning, praying woman, who cried and screamed at intervals for husband and baby, and would not be comforted even when one of the brass button officers assured her that her child was safe in the care of John Rowland, a brave and trusty sailor, who was certainly in the other boat with it. He did not tell her, of course, that Rowland had hailed from the berg as she lay unconscious, and that if he still had the child, it was with him there, deserted. 